Well, the video's title style does seem to be an in thing these days. But greetings all, it is time for the next Q&A, number 28 if you keep in track, or can't read the title. I have been stupidly busy since I last did one of these. Though I have handed off command of my detachment and I'm back to being a pure staff officer, it's quite a busy officer's position, so I'm still occupied just doing different things. The big thing, I guess, is the week that I spent in Belgium. I've discovered new vehicles, a new worst ever driver's position, and a bunch of other things, so you can expect quite a Belgian focus in the future. However, I've taken a gamble in that I have hired a cameraman and editor. He goes by Fix It and Post, and he will help give, I hope, a better quality product. And frankly, he's more creative than I am, so we'll see what fun videos might come up. However, you can imagine how much it costs to hire a professional for a week and pay for travel and lodging overseas in Europe. So, if you have half an interest in merchandise, and of course I went and forgot my samples, but anyway, uh, I would appreciate it. YouTube ad revenue isn't quite as great as you might think it is. I'm also debating looking into sponsorships, uh, but I'm not sure I quite want to go there yet if I can avoid it. Anyway, I drank more beer than I have since college. The reputation of Belgium is uh, quite accurate. You should start seeing those videos come out in a couple of weeks, and there are going to be quite a few of them. I'll try to break it up with a few non-Belgian things. Only other thing I need to do uh, to knock out my thesis for the Masters. I uh, haven't figured out just what I'm going to do it on yet. It's probably going to be tank destroyers, US vehicle manufacturing, but yeah, that's for after Christmas. I have also gotten myself back into DCS. If anyone can recommend a casual server for a tanker, I'd appreciate it. I'm on the vegan right now. I've parked the F5 and Huey for a bit. Huey is a lot of fun, but it is just as well that I decided to go with a fixed wing license and not rotary. I would have killed myself several times over by now. Vortex ring stage is a bitch. Speaking of recommendations, I have a Lionel problem. Uh, due to an unfortunate accident involving a blind dog, the soundboard on my 1970s Hudson has given up the ghost. She's still a great runner, lights, smoke, work, but the mighty sound of steam is not so mighty anymore. Actually, it's non-existent. If someone has any recommendations for either a good repairman in the central Texas area or a relatively easy home fix replacement, I'll be looking to hear it. Also, the traction tires on the Jeep behind are a little bit loose. I'd appreciate a note from anybody who could tell me where to get appropriate sized replacements. Finally, Bernard and Chris over on Military History Visualized Military Aviation History have released another book, this time the translated manual on Soviet armored tactics of World War II, and have asked me to plug it. If you want a copy, link below. They also say they're going to give me a copy to give away to one of you guys, uh, but I have to figure out how to do that. I'll probably just pick an appealing person from the comments. Anyway, to the questions, and starting with Alexander H. What is my opinion on Boxer compared to Striker? Well, I don't recall ever walking up to a Boxer, let alone crawling around inside one, so my opinion is limited. However, I have two observations. One, Boxer is freaking huge. Now, in fairness, most modern wheeled APCs are freaking huge, and that's what you get for trying to emphasize mind protection, I guess. But when I say they are big, I mean they are genuinely difficult to get down a backcountry road. I was talking to an Irish chap, the Piranha 3 APCs they have now, which are basically striker sized, are towards the end of their life and an eye is being kept out for a replacement, supposedly starting 2026. Uh, but the current generation of big 8x8s is considered undesirable. Second, note how few nations have chosen Boxer for its modular capability. As near as I can tell, uh, but I am open to be corrected here, Pretty much every nation has purchased an equivalent number of chassis and of modules. So the idea of having different spare modules for different roles does seem, and I think correctly, to have been sidelined in practice. Now, presumably there are advantages of the modular design in terms of efficiency of manufacturing. And I can see at least a theoretical advantage of having a swappable module. So for example, if a small army's one ambulance is broken down, just stick the ambulance module on the back of a working PC's hull or some such, and you have your ambulance back in service. 
However, beyond that, the fact that it seems to be reasonably successful in the export market does seem to indicate that it is a fundamentally sound vehicle. I am not sure, however, how much of a true comparison it is between Stryker and Boxer. Remember, the purpose of Stryker was to be air mobile. If you want to fly a Boxer around in an A400, you need to use two airplanes to do it. One for the hull and one for the module. And I'm not sure that the thing fits into a C-130 at all. Now, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here. It's worth noting that as the US Army is moving back to the division being the basic unit of action instead of independent brigades, I'm not sure just how much they intend to be flying strikers around anymore. The striker brigades are being added to the armoured divisions, working alongside tanks and Bradleys, not to the air mobile divisions. Thus, it seems to me that the army has abandoned the purpose for which the striker was purchased in the first place. Now, this is entirely personal speculation. Believe it or not, I am not privy to the secret planning sessions in the Pentagon, although if somebody wants to see me, I won't mind. But I have a suspicion that the striker is being kept as the third brigade in the new armored divisions, and not the strike divisions, formerly known as penetration or heavy, is that the army has the things, they still have some useful service life, and it is not an efficient use of money to replace them early. I further suspect that what will happen is that the army will continue its force design experimentation and see whether or not there is any merit to the armored divisions having a wheeled brigade for mobility at the cost of lethality, and that in a decade or two, when the strikers are due for replacement, the army will then decide whether it wants to replace the vehicles with more wheeled vehicles, likely of boxer size since they don't care about air mobility anymore, or to make all three brigades in the division identical with tanks and OMFVs. I will presumably be retired by then. White Sagittarius would like to know the strangest and weirdest tank engagement or battle in history. That is an extremely wide-ranging question. For all I know, it's something I've never heard of in the Chaco War between Bolivia and Paraguay, or something equally obscure. So I'm not even going to try to answer it, and what I'll ask is for people to put their suggestions in the comments, and I will come back to this in the next video. Robert Henry Ilston, if an American tank were hit, other than a complete burnout, what types of damage would be considered recoverable versus complete loss or salvage for parts? Could tanks which had been completely penetrated be recoverable? Well, for the very long answer on the practicalities of vehicle recovery and repair, I have a video I recorded over on Perun's channel. Actually, now I think about it, I'll just ask him if I can upload that one segment to my channel as well as an independent video. It's worth noting that the question on repair versus write-offs is probably a matter of time available and manpower available, you know, the old METTC thing, as much as equipment available. Almost anything can be repaired, but should it? The Green Book for the Ordnance Department mentions shipping shortages in World War II of anything from engines to recoil mechanisms, and there is an interesting case study mentioned. First Army had some 200 unserviceable tank engines in the UK when it set off across the channel. It dragged along the engines on the back of tank transporters most of the way across France, simply because the ordnance men didn't have the time to go cannibalize other vehicles and overhaul the engines. Now, in the end, they contracted with a French engine manufacturing plant to overhaul the things, and those became the only 200 spare engines that First Army had for a four month period during the supply crisis towards the end of the French campaign. There are two takeaways here. One is that the ordnance men were sufficiently unsure about supply that they dragged those engines along with them in the hope of getting them repaired. And two, the idea that cannibalization was the primary intended source of parts for these repairs. And I think there's something to it. The army is going to know which parts are more likely to break down or wear out and send more of those over. If it is the one time in a hundred that part Y needs to be replaced, maybe due to battle damage or just bizarre luck, then there is an excellent chance that said part can be found on an even more destroyed tank and used. Complete penetrations, by the way, would absolutely be repaired. 
So you shape the hole into a cone, you weld a conical plug into it, and then you grind it down. Now, I can't seem to find a photograph right now offhand, but they do exist. I've seen them. B7 wants to revisit the, quote, silly and arbitrary, unquote, classification of MBTs. Why is an M47 an MBT but not an M46? Or was either? After all, Centurion and M47 are often considered MBTs, but heavy tanks Conqueror and M103 were designed to work alongside them. So surely that will make them mediums. If so, would M60 then be the first US MBT as it was intended to operate in an environment without friendly heavy tanks? Now, I thought I attacked this somewhere before, but anyway, uh, Zaloga has postulated Panther as the first MBT, and I think there is some merit in the idea. None of the 1940s or 50s tanks, including everyone's favorite contenders for MBT title, T-54 and Centurion, were designed as MBTs. They just kind of evolved into the role from the original specifications, and that role could arguably be done by Panther. So in my opinion, it is an extremely ephemeral concept, ephemeral, ephemeral, whatever. Uh, and if you want to consider M46 to be an MBT, go for it. She had a second question, apparently fueled by an excess of Hesperidina. Which is more realistic, Girls on Panzer or World of Tanks? Within the constructs of their environments, it's a very difficult question, but I can certainly feel more immersion into the GUP universe, as it does have a background beyond just the tactics and the tanks, to put the whole thing in context. Caleb Engelhart. What was the best place I've been to film, i.e. accommodating space for gear, etc., which was the least fun? Now, honestly, I've never had a negative experience in filming. Uh, generally speaking, any visit I've gone to has had some form of friendly pre-existing relationship. The locations believe it's in their interest to have me come film and are hoping to make life easier in order to allow me to make a better product. In return, I take best efforts to reduce any impact and extra work that they need to undertake in order to allow us to film. After all, I would like to be invited back. Concerns are often more a matter of simply getting there. Some places are easier or cheaper to get to from where I am in Central Texas than others. Josh Conti. With the acceptance of the M10 taking over from the 1128 MGS, what will happen to the MGS? The question has a false premise. Sorry, Josh. The M10 does not replace the MGS. It performs a similar task, but in a different formation. The M10s go into the infantry divisions. The strikers are going to the armored divisions. So insofar as a striker unit in the near future is going to get a tracked armored vehicle with a big gun in support, it's probably going to be a cross attachment from one of the armored brigades elsewhere in the division. Instead, the strikers are going with the 30mm Dragoon, and presumably Carl Gustafs, as the next best thing. MGS itself has been retired from service. Also, what is the M10 classified as? Assault gun? TD? Etc? The official designation is Combat Vehicle Full Tracked Light Armored 105mm M10 Booker. The role is, in effect, an assault gun. I really do think it's analogous to the long-barreled Stug, as unlike the American assault guns of World War II, it has a high-velocity gun, and unlike the Swedish IKB-91, has a pretty reasonable level of armor. Felicity Longus. In John Weeks's Men Against Tanks, he describes the measures taken by both sides of the Spanish Civil War to handle enemy armor. Aside from the more proactive measures of actually trying to destroy the tanks, he speaks of measures meant to trick or scare tank crews. Things such as spacing dinner plates across a road to stop in advance for fear of mines. Were such measures officially adopted by forces in World War II to simply scare crews into stopping their advance? Well, not specifically for tanks as much as for anything. Uh, deception has always been a part of warfare. You set up a bunch of logs to make it look like a towed anti-tank gun position, for example. There's the old saw, how many mines does it take to make a minefield? Answer, none, just put up a sign. Stick a piece of pipe on a 76mm gun to make it look like a 90 and fire paint rounds out of it. 
Personally, I'm waiting for someone in 11th Cav to go buy a few model desert tortoises and put a few on avenues of approach and wait for entire battalions to come to a screeching halt. But granted, that might actually not work in actual warfare. But yes, dragging chains around behind tanks in the desert to make dust clouds and make it look like they're armored units behind the hill, whatever. Uh, decoys and fakery are not only used as cheap targets for the opposition to expend their munitions on, but also to make the enemy think capabilities are present which are not. He also wants me to say, one thing is for sure, the sheep is not a creature of the air. You're welcome. Captain Tanker Joe. Since 9-11, the US military seems to have shifted away from using the division and has a larger focus on the brigade combat team. Was this transition meant to be permanent? And will we return to the traditional units in the next major conflict? It actually goes back to the immediate post-Cold War period where rapid intervention in smaller scale problems was on the minds of the powers that were and it was the impetus particularly for the striker brigades. The strikers were not the only such brigades, however, so one of my combat patches was for the 81st, which at the time was an enhanced armored brigade separate, independent of any division, although earmarked to work with the second. There were 15 enhanced separate brigades in the army at the time. Now, of course, after 9-11, we really did refocus on the coin fight, and there was little time to think about conventional combat, no matter what level you were at, unless you were stationed in Korea, which I'm to understand never really got out of the high-intensity mindset for reasonable enough reasons. In the end, brigades became independent operators with support from division headquarters, who ended up commanding whatever brigade was assigned to them, no matter where they came from. However, a refocus on the division as the basic unit of action has been undertaken, and that is the point of the Force 2030 restructuring. He also wants to know, what is my favorite North American built diesel electric locomotive? I guess my personal bias is going to come into play here. I'll go with the 071 class, simply because it was the flagship of the Irish fleet when growing up, and I used to love seeing them. It's one of the few European locos with the American style external walkways. Also, as far as I know, the record for the single heaviest load ever air transported still belongs to EMD and Irish Rail for the 201 class. However, there are honorable mentions to the PA on pure prettiness and to the narrow-nosed SD-70s, as they just look downright ready to get down to the business of hauling serious tonnage of freight. But again, it is also biased, because, well, those latter date to when I was growing up, and my dad had an ATSF layout with war bonnets prominent. Wookie Davidson. Why were tank destroyers used in urban combat? There are pictures of M10s being used in a fire support role in cities like San Lo or Manila. But wouldn't open-top tanks be more susceptible? Well, yes, they are more susceptible. And that's precisely why overhead cover was eventually developed for the vehicles. Although I also it was mainly to do with overhead artillery or tree bursts. But anyway, you got two main reasons. The first is non-doctrinal. They are armored vehicles with a big gun, which is better than being an unarmored rifleman with a small gun. Doctrine be damned, use them as infantry support instead of sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for an enemy panzer attack. And if that's where the enemy is to fight, well then to the cities they went. The doctrinal reason is that by the 1944 revision of FM 18-5, the use of tank destroyers in a bunker busting role was officially approved. They did, after all, have an excellent gun for the purpose. They also had more armor than some of the other vehicles used for the purpose. So in Aachen, the 155mm M12 was famously used in a direct fire bunker busting role, for example. So the TDs weren't quite as badly off. And given that the Ukrainians are losing M2s and Leopards to mines, is this a case of the Ukrainians lacking training or a doctrine thing, or is it simply bad luck? You can never discount enemy skill when assessing losses, and the Russians may well have laid their minefields very well. And there is a huge caveat in that the videos we are seeing are always of individual actions 
and entirely without larger context of shaping or supporting operations. Breaches of obstacles are some of the most convoluted and difficult things for a military to do. So back when I was doing the captain's course, successful completion of a combined arms breach was like the holy grail in gold standard. Heaven forbid we should train for withdrawal under pressure. Now, although apparently that is coming back onto the curriculum now. I needed to put breaches into a sort of a Tanks 200 series video, uh, but the bottom line is that I'm more willing to consider institutional failings of intelligence, equipment, or execution than simply attributing the losses to bad luck or particular skill on the Russian part. Now, that's not to say that, oh, the US Army wouldn't take losses at a defended obstacle belt, but I have a feeling it would take a much less likely threshold to do it. Again, these are incredibly complicated operations which require a massive range of skills and capabilities to do right, and few nations can do it. That said, I strongly doubt that the Ukrainians will be making the same errors for long. Teku. I mentioned that the Sherman's gyro stabilizer was initially hated because nobody trained the troops on how it worked or how to maintain it. Are there other instances of this happening, i.e. equipment being added with no training? The one which immediately comes to mind is the provision of bazookas to 34th ID in North Africa. As I recall, they were delivered the day before the Battle of Kasserine Pass, and nobody had had the time to receive a course of instruction on how to use the things. That was more a problem of unfortunate timing than an institutional level problem of an active decision to overclassify equipment such as happened with the M4. I have certainly suffered from the problems of classification hiding knowledge from myself. Now, we repeatedly get told by the collection guys, always ask for effects, not specific platforms. Which is fine if you know what sort of effects are possible. If you keep a capability so secret that we don't know how to, that you can do it, how can you expect us to ask for it? So I was, I was brought aside by one intel chap after a meeting and they told me, Sir, you need to ask for this. You can do that? I, I, I have images of Dr. Strangelove. But the whole purpose of a, of a doomsday device is you tell the opposition. Why didn't you tell the world? It was going to be released at the party conference next Tuesday. Anyway, I have absolutely no doubt that oftentimes little used or little trained buttons or switches or whatever on gadgets and equipment are forgotten about or discounted simply due to a lack of familiarity. I just don't know what they are since I lack the familiarity to tell you. It's sort of like the Dunning-Kruger effect. I don't know what I don't know. Also, I've opined on the Bob Semple tank, but what about that other Kiwi creation, the Schofield? I have not encountered a single test report on it. The obvious comparison is to the STRV M31, which I covered in a video. One reasonable feature, I think, is that in the interest of simplicity, no pure wheel-to-track conversion system was created. You did have to get out and remove wheels and attach an adapter plate. Now, this isn't entirely unheard of. Consider the use of adding a gear when converting BT7 from wheel to tract. Useful only on good roads. However, whether the basic Chevy truck underlying design was suitable for the armor gun turret, I have no clue. Now, it must have had some success or they wouldn't have sent it to the UK for further trials. Andrew Hills actually has a book out specifically on the Schofield. Now, I haven't read it but I'm sure it is going to have most everything you can think of which you might want. He's also got a video on his channel up showing the early prototypes in motion, link below. However, in reality, I don't see why it would have particularly survived the arrival of the American light tanks any better than the Christie-based designs did in practice. Of course, and such was the case for Schofield. Remember, the US abandoned the Christie's when they discovered the DM1 series, which morphed into Stuart, was in practice as fast on a road march as the Christie's were, at least after the army had finished modifying them to be combat capable. The Schofields might have had a few kilometers an hour over the Stuarts on a motorway, such as any such things might have existed in New Zealand at the time, but I suspect not enough to make a difference on a real world road. However, if Kiwiland really did want to make a tank on its own, in a world where stewards are not available, 
It seems reasonable to conclude that had they made the Schofield tank tracks only and abandoned the convertible idea, it may well have been a quite viable vehicle. Thunderchild. I've worked with various nations' militaries. Are there lessons or ideas you've encountered from other nations that the U.S. would do well to adopt and reconsider? Or consider, sorry. Uh, for example, in Ireland, using the second to last man in the column to cover the rear. First thing that comes to mind is to take the French idea of getting a couple of guys in a regiment. Their sole job is to break, uh, bake bread. Uh, and they do a damn good job of it in the field. Anyway. British-style vehicle checkpoints, especially pop-up ones as developed in Northern Ireland, are, I think, a far more efficient way of doing business. Indeed, when we went to Iraq, the US brought in British advisors to give us a crash course in coin. More recently, uh, I liked the way that the British jumped or relocated their division tactical command post, and I did appreciate the brevity of their situation update briefs in their division CPs. However, other times, it's sometimes a factor of just two different ways of getting to the same end state, which are equally valid and just ways of getting things done. Now, I like the British dislike of long meetings, and the British were certainly not thrilled by some of the US meetings, but the meetings seem to work for the Americans. So who's to say that it should or shouldn't be adopted? And unfortunately, that last position is most likely the answer for everything. There is a lot of crosstalk, particularly between allies, on the subject of exchanging and comparing TTPs. And there is probably a reason why people who get paid a lot more than me to make such decisions have gone, well, that's interesting, but we'll keep doing it this way. John Cryer, it's time to design a new armored recon vehicle for the cavalry as the Brad's getting a bit long in the tooth. And yes, you're bringing back the ACRs. In view of having to possibly fight the umpteenth Battle of the Missourian Lakes in the Suwalki Gap, which has an abundance of what engineers refer to as wet gaps, do you make the vehicles amphibious, at least as far as inland waters go? If so, which method do you use for it? Part of the problem with amphibiousness is that it's a little bit overstated. The shorelines are often not conducive to such operations, and you will notice the lack of such operations in Ukraine. However, the procurement folks are not idiots. The Koreans or Poles would not be making requirements for the vehicles to have amphibious capability if they didn't see a practical use case for the things. However, though the terrain may be similar, the US Army's doctrine and equipment may not be. Again, more than one way to skin a cat. And remember, for the US's purposes, that includes heavy close combat which immediately removes a lot of the lighter options, such as using a canvas screen or just dropping a trim vein and going for it. The only remaining option is something like the Korean inflatables or the old US World War II Ritchie devices. If they could get a 30-ton Sherman to float with a Ritchie device, I see no reason they can't get an OMFV type vehicle to float either. Of course, another way of doing the job is simply not to sacrifice any of the cavalry vehicle capability at all and just provide more bridging assets. If it's an opposed river crossing, you'll probably want to do a deliberate attack anyway. If it's not opposed, well, there's nothing stopping the bridge from being made. Modern bridging is a lot faster than it used to be after all. Or better yet, if you're not talking to any vehicles, such as in a recon unit, just ferry them across and you don't have a signature visible to satellite or radar going, a bridge just popped up here, care to guess why? The old ACRs were also heavier on support assets than their equivalent size brigades, so adding more engineers does have precedent. That's assuming that the doctrinaires even decide to bring back ACRs. They are notable by their absence in Force 2030. But it is worth noting just how much more engineering support the armored strike divisions have compared to the current armored division structure, so there very well could be some role crossover. The question really thus becomes, for Poland or Korea or wherever, is the amphibious capability of the vehicle the first choice, or is it a reflection of those countries' national limitations on the amount of engineering support that they can provide? Jaeger has heard this following dad joke and thinks it is so good it needs repeating. Question, are 200 zeros a lot? Answer. 
Depends on their position. Behind a decimal point? No. Over Pearl Harbor? Yes. I don't know. Arian, the Calliope shows up frequently in games as an artillery tank. Was it actually effective? Well, there are a number of different types of rockets which were placed on the Shermans, and some of them are American, and there were also the British Tulips. Insofar as the things are area effect weapons, and the tank was equipped for indirect fire targeting by way of the quadrant and azimuth indicator, I don't see why it would have been particularly ineffective. Folks on the receiving end of a racket battery, racket, rocket battery, probably don't care much about what system actually launched it. The problem, though, is that I'm not entirely sure what people were thinking when they decided they wanted to put the thing onto a tank in the first place. Why not a trailer? Why are you saddling this vehicle with a massive rocket launcher? It's probably why the idea went away pretty quickly. Kazuki K. Why is the M1 one of the few tanks that have solid side skirts? Well, they're not all solid. Only the first couple of skirts are armored. The ones towards the rear are not. The thinking being that the enemy is likely to be to the front-ish. A certain percentage of shots are going to come in at an angle which will penetrate the whole sides. So the skirts are angled to the extent that you know, any incoming rounds are going to hit the armored skirt near the front before hitting the whole side near the rear. Now, anything beyond that percentage, I mean, coming in from this side, for example, well, it's not going to get stopped by armor, ARAT tiles notwithstanding. So the problem is really you're striking a balance between the proportion of shots that you want from outside a direct front that will be stopped by the armor plate before it gets to the, the inner hull about this far back versus the problems which are caused by the additional weight of armor. And in this, the problem is not too different from that of another of other vehicles. And you will see thick armor over the first three road wheels of modern levered twos. A similar theory was used by T90 with the additional protection on the front of the skirt. The British, however, said sod it and just slapped stuff all over the length of the skirts. Also, it's often seen in games, but was zigzagging whilst motoring at high speed ever done as a way to make it hard for the enemy to get a bead on your vehicle? Yes. It definitely goes back to World War II. To quote General Ernest, the third army tank destroyer chief, you need quick acceleration, a quick start, stop and turn like a polo pony. To see my video on M18 from the Book of Armaments. In a more modern sense, it's called the Sagger Dance. Now, of course, missiles are a little bit better than saggers these days, but the name has stuck. And it quite literally is zigzagging at best speed to make yourself a tough target. Yes, in the realm of quick reacting or even autonomous guidance systems, it's less of a useful technique. But bear in mind that you're still looking at a two second time of flight for a saber round to get two miles. A jink at a fortunate time could be the difference between a hit or a miss, so the theoretical benefit is still there. Now, if it's worth the time delay in getting from A to B is another matter entirely. Scenario. Has the US ever stuck tank turrets onto its naval vessels, similar to the Soviets and North Koreans, etc.? I can't think of any, unless you want to say like the Mark 50 Sea Protector was a derivative of the Strikers RWS or some such, but even then I don't know which came first. The Navy usually has the budget to do bespoke equipping. The closest oddity I can think of was sticking standard ARMs onto Asheville class boats. Uh, those aren't normally considered ship-based weapons. PT-109 famously had a towed anti-tank gun strap to the front. However, uh, the military has certainly tried putting entire vehicles on board. Recently enough, the Marines strapped uh, LAV-25s to the edges of LHAs on the basis that the stabilized 25mm would be handy protection against small craft. Ian Shaw has a salvo question, so enter my rapid fire round. How much work goes into commonality between vehicles? For example, was it intentional to have the M10 and M1 share parts to reduce training burden? It doesn't hurt, though in the specific case of M10 it was not listed as an evaluation criterion. Commonality of parts, though, will make the building of the vehicle cheaper and may reduce problems in the supply chain. I must presume that each factor is evaluated in the overall conclusion. 
What's the position on borrowing features from competing vehicles, such as licensing a BAE v uh, feature onto a GDLS vehicle? That is a question I directly asked the folks in charge of vehicle procurement in my interview on modern vehicle procurement, link below. Go to the timestamp of 1 hour 2547. If an autoloader runs out of uh, a type of ammo, does it default to a next type of round or does it simply fail to load anything? Well, that tends to depend on the autoloader in question. I believe most will simply stop and not load around. Might the army introduce a height limit for AFV crewmen in the future? I don't see why they would. The army has long held a 95th percentile rule because it doesn't want to limit the options of putting the best people in the most suited positions. I presume anyway. Uh, there is no indication that it is going to change and you will find in the requirements documents that when the requirements list the 95th percentile, it also lists the census or the data set, sorry, that is to be used to determine that 95th percentile. And it's usually the most recent 95th percentile. So the, the standards do change as we grow. The British are spending a fortune on Ajax. What can it do which a boxer cannot with the appropriate module? Well, the short version is that A, Ajax is tracked, so it can go more places, and B, Boxer is already freaking ginormous. Then look at the size of Boxer with an autocannon turret. It may be a heavy recon vehicle, but it's still a recon vehicle. Uh, that's also assuming the Boxer with an autocannon turret can contain all of Ajax's features, whatever they are. But the short answer is they have different capabilities and I would not consider them to be interchangeable. Ian Barlow, I'm getting a gaming PC soon. Good for you. Are there any good tank sims? World War II for preference, but we'll give anything a go. There are fewer these days than you might think. The gold standard for tank sims is Steel Beasts, but it is expensive, complicated, and has a limited player base. Think of it like DCS for tanks. Uh, but it has the most modern equipment. Now, if you go back a generation, you have Gunner Heat PC, which is late Cold War and a lot more user accessible as a player. You go back another generation and you get Steel Armor Blaze of War, which brings us to the Coincidence Rangefinder generation. And then you really start getting into more older sims, like T-72 Boxes and Fire, or if you really go back a few years, Panzer Elite, still, oddly, seems to be the best World War II sim after all these years. Yes, I have played many games of M1 Tank Platoon 2, but no, it's just too old. Reichsbeer Minister! It looks like... I, 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 I am wondering whether or not that was ever a real position. I hope it was. <laughs> I hope it actually was in the Reich, a beer minister. It looks like the US randomly paired engines with vehicles. How were engines and vehicles matched up and which were preferred? The US suffered from much the same problem as the British did. The country was not developing tank engines. There was no commercial benefit to it. With the US buying tanks by the half dozen or less for nearly two decades, it was not going to be a great return on the investment. It's not that engines weren't still being designed. I mean, the US still had its fantastic automotive industry, but the needs of trucks and cars don't really mesh all that well with those of a tank, particularly when it comes to compactness and power to weight for the power that they need to put out. As a result, the decision was made to use aircraft engines, hence the radials in the M1 light tank and M2 medium which was fine for peacetime, but there was a problem in that when the war started, FDR decided he was really gonna emphasize the expansion of the Army Air Corps. That required all the production of aircraft engines and then some, which is why the Wright radials were subsequently made by Continental. Wright simply couldn't make enough of them for both needs. Still, that wasn't gonna be enough, so requirements were set out basically, here's what we need, what do you got? The immediate solutions were to simply combine engines, the twin diesels for the M4A2, the pentuple six cylinders in the M4A4, uh, they're the obvious ones, but don't forget the twin Cadillacs in the M5 and M24, or no, think about it, the triple in Sentinel. Finally, two more suitable engines were developed. Ford cut down a V12 to make the GAA series in M4A3, and Continental basically tweaked the right cyclone to make the diesel, uh, technically multi-fuel, but effectively diesel, RD1820 in the M4A6. Each variant did have its proponents. The M4A2s were liked particularly for export use. 
The Marines, like the British, felt that there was a little less of a fire hazard for the diesel engine, though the difference still seemed minimal. However, for overall performance, the Corps really wanted petrol. Uh, but some of the diesel Shermans hung around for a while, even after the A3s arrived to replace them. The British ended up being heavy users of the A4. The A4 was disliked by the Americans, particularly due to the difficulty in maintaining, in effect, five engines bolted together and thus not being sufficiently reliable. But the British and Chrysler knuckled down to fixing the problems. Combined also with some rearranging, such as putting all five fuel filters, carbs, etc. together for easy maintenance access. By the time they were done, the A4 was probably the most reliable Sherman of the lot, which is saying something. It did suck a fair bit of oil and fuel though, and was a bit heavier due to the larger size. The A6 program died after the army decided it was going to focus all its equipment on petrol power, so they only built 75 of them. Uh, but there was nothing inherently wrong with the power plant that I know of. Oshin Krenin did, or do, the Soviets, or Russians, really calculate plans on the basis of formula of forces needed to achieve a goal. Yes. The term these days is correlation of forces and means, coffin, and to a point all sides do it today. The related term is combat potential. It's actually a fairly involved topic and probably worthy of an independent video on the subject which I'll add to my ever increasing list. John Kettner, what do you see as a defense against drone swarms at the battalion level over the next few years? Good question. The current solution seems to be 30 millimeter proximity fuse ammunition for hard kills. I don't know if lasers are fast enough to burn and recharge against a swarm. I suspect that electronic attack is going to be the best option as something which can affect multiple targets at once from a single, a single platform. Of course, that may, live, uh, that may leave the emitter open to targeting itself by basically an anti-radiation missile. But hey, nobody said it would be easy. Of course, one can always try issuing 12 gauges with clay pigeon loads. USA, USA. Why wasn't the ACAV of Vietnam fame developed for use in Europe? I guess mainly because the battlefield was different. Nobody was expecting up-close ambushes in the Fulda Gap. The M113, after all, isn't supposed to be a mounted combat vehicle. It was designed as a battle taxi. I suspect also part of the reason it wasn't adopted by CAV units was the desire for the US to field equipment to recon units which were visually identical to the equipment of the line units, so as to mask the identity of those recon units. S-Face, how does a commander decide if an immobilized M1 should be salvaged or destroyed, and what happens to the crew? There's nothing specifically in the manual on the subject, but it fundamentally boils down to the ability to, the, uh, to secure it until recovery. If you can't afford to leave anybody behind to keep an eye on it until follow-on forces arrive, then destroy it. Or specifically certain components like the breach and engine. The crew will probably end up hitching a ride with the first sergeant's M113. Or MV these days, I guess. John McMillan wants to know what is the status of Striker Dragoon. He's not seen any evidence of it in any substantial numbers. His understanding is that it was intended to counter BTR-90s and BMD-4s in Eastern Europe. Has the project been shelved? Or are Dragoons going to be fielded en masse? Dragoon was indeed originally a low volume solution. It was an operational needs statement from 2nd Cav Regiment. For whatever reason, the army decided that the only major formation to stay in Europe was to be a striker one, which was, well, never really intended to take on the role of an armored unit. In any case, someone in 2CR decided that perhaps something capable of taking on enemy light armor at range would be handy. The anti-tank strikers would probably be well busy dealing with tanks, and the MGS, although it could do the job, it only had a few rounds for it, as they're really supposed to knock out strong points after all. But a 30mm cannon would be able to destroy quite a few vehicles in a short space of time. However, at the time, 2CR was the only use case for the things. When fully fielded, the brigade would have 81 of the ICVDs, as they'd be called, which would be about half of the vehicles in the rifle and scout units. Since then, MGS has been retired, leaving a bit of a firepower hole. 
the 30 millimeter was chosen to fix it and a couple of years ago orders were placed for an additional 270 or so vehicles to field to three more striker brigades now these aren't identical to route to a dragoon they have a, a different turret and hull although they are generally similar in design and have the xma 13 cannon i do not know if they are also going to be called dragoons but anyway you are going to be seeing more of them also, why is the US looking at both an MPF heavier than a light tank and a new Abrams A3 lighter than the previous generation? Surely both vehicles fill the role of big gun, adequate armor, and not too heavy to actually get to wherever the US needs to project power. Why are two different vehicles needed for what is a similar set of requirements? Well, the short answer is that they're not that similar. The M1 E3 is going to be lighter than the current 70 tons, but there is still a substantial difference between that and the MPF's 40 ton limit. I would also observe that whatever weight the M1 E3 goes down to, I am not convinced it's going to stay there. One of the lines in the press release was along the lines of, the M1 has reached the limits of its growth potential at its current weight. So much over 70 tons might be overdoing it, but the army does seem to believe that it's capable of operating and maintaining at least up to 70 tons, because that's what it's doing. Thus, it seems to me that part of the purpose of the E3 program isn't so much to lighten the weight of the vehicle for its own sake, as much as it is to allow for some future growth expansion of capabilities. Whatever weight the E3 ends up being when it's approved, I have a suspicion it'll be a bit heavier when it's gone out of service. MPF, however, is going to have to remain more or less at its 40 ton limit as long as C-17s are still the standard thing. Oscar, what was the most overrated World War II tank of any nation? My vote right now is the Char B-1, the best tank of the early 1920s to see service in World War II. Far overrated. Masonic Rat. Why do Ukrainian airborne troops use T-80s? Seems a little bit heavy. Indeed, I have made a similar observation. Frankly, I think it's unlikely that they're ever going to be used in an airborne operation and that they are very much a case of using a name for heritage. Much like the US's 10th Mountain Division isn't a mountain warfare unit, and I'm fairly sure that the recently activated 11th Airborne Division isn't particularly trained in airborne operations. Which is a better autoloader, Russian carousel or French bustle? French bustle for me, but see the question later on about the American carousel. Why did the US use only M48s in Vietnam? Now, mainly due to the fact there was nothing around which required the M60s 105 compared to the requirements over in Europe. I do seem to recall that some M68 VLBs were used for whatever reason, but the 90mm was basically good enough for dealing with the MVA and VC targets. Con of class. What are the advantages and disadvantages of HESH, or an American HEP? Well, there are three advantages, well, two anyway, but the third I'm speculating. Firstly, like heat, it doesn't lose effectiveness over distance. Secondly, it performs a pretty good destructive round for things like structures, better than heat. Probably works against infantry a bit better as well, due to the larger amount of explosives. The speculation is that it may be able to affect, at least to some extent, more metal than a heat round. So heat penetrates or does not. Hesh doesn't work on penetration in the first place, it's down how much of the shock and vibration makes it through the metal. Enough might still get through to at least cause some damage to components. As for disadvantages, well firstly it is a very slow heavy round and particularly sensitive to range errors. Secondly, you probably want a rifled cannon to fire it, which is an issue for saber rounds. What was the Soviet opinion of Valentine? Well, according to tank archives, it was an adequately fast vehicle, and that was an opinion shared by the British as it happened. The top speed may appear slow in comparison to other top speeds, but the power and gearing was such that it didn't actually slow down much on obstacles or curves, so it tended to even out in practice. The armor was good for the weight class, and it was well reliable. On the downside, the gun was puny, and it led to various efforts to upgun it. The Soviets did trial a six pounder variant in Mark 9, but the problem was that though the gun was better in the anti-armor role, it still didn't meet requirements for high explosive effect, 
which is also why the gun didn't find particular favor with the US Army as a tank gun either. By the time the 75mm Valentine was in production, they weren't exactly short on T-34s and Shermans. Little Z, or Z. Why did early 76mm armed Shermans and Hellcats not have a muzzle brake but added it on later? Well, because it wasn't necessary. It's worth observing that even though it was officially named a muzzle brake, it wasn't really. Normally, muzzle brakes are added as a requirement to get the gun to work correctly. It reduces the recoil transferred to the recoil system. So if your recoil system is strong enough, with a long enough stroke and on a heavy enough vehicle, you don't need a muzzle brake, which is why they've gone away. The first muzzle brake was developed in 1842 by Colonel de Beaulieu of France, which, if you're curious, predates the first recoil mechanism of 1888. Anyway, why isn't a 76mm muzzle brake actually a muzzle brake, even though it's called a muzzle brake? Well, to quote an observation from the late 1940s. In some cases, the muzzle brake is used only because of its anti-obscuration effect. Here, however, the brake should be called, more rightly, an anti-obscuration device or blast deflector. And thus it was for the 76mm guns on M18 and M4. They were designed not for braking purposes, as the mounts could already handle the recoil, but for obscuration purposes, to allow the crews to see what it was that they were shooting. It presumably also reduced the visual signature of the shot. Now, a properly designed blast deflector can have a braking effect, but there comes a point at which the braking effect has more of an effect at creating blast obs uh, obscuration and discomfort to the crew than it does at reducing the obscuration that you're trying to reduce. By the 1950s, the US started officially distinguishing between blast deflectors and muzzle brakes in their nomenclature. But for the purposes of World War II, the guns were placed in service without the brakes because the brakes weren't ready yet. And as they weren't mechanically needed, there was no problem in doing so. As to your truck question, well, I've not really looked into it. I probably should. Similarly, Raptor team would like me to expand upon the ARSV program of the late 1960s and early 70s. This is the Armored Scout Reconnaissance Vehicle program for which the XM800 vehicles were built. Now it turns out after doing some digging there is a lot out there which definitely requires a proper dedicated video. Now I've mentioned it before but a quick recap. The ASRV was developed to replace the M114 Reconnaissance Command Vehicle, which turned out to be unacceptable and was relatively quickly discarded. The requirement was put out in 1968. In the end, 14 vehicles were tested or looked into, so tracked. XM800T, XM800D, uh, which was basically a derivative of the T, M113A1, which is the likely interim vehicle with the baseline, by which all the other vehicles would be tested. M113A1 product improved, aka the AIFV, or, or basically the YPR 765 with a 20 millimeter. M113 and a half, more commonly known as the Lynx in a Canadian configuration. The M113 and a half product improved, which seems to be being closer to the Dutch Lynx, but with a 20 millimeter. A D-turreted M551 Sheridan with seats for scouts instead, which reminds me a bit of the M18's CNR variant. A Scimitar CVRT, the MICV or XM723, basically the Bradley predecessor, and an M60A1, which was also used as a reference point. The idea being that if the recon vehicles proved not able to go faster than M60s, including pauses for maintenance, etc., it would likely be eliminated. The thinking being that the scouts needed to be more mobile than the formations that they were scouting for. On the wheeled side, there was the Lockheed XM800W, another variant without the turret, the XR311 Dune Buggy, the V150, and a Suzuki 185cc motorcycle, considered as an ancillary vehicle. Remember, there was talk when the M3 Bradley was selected that a motorcycle be carried in the back. The XM800T D version, the two Lynx variants, Scimitar and the turretless Sheridan, all fell below the mobility of the M113A1 and were rejected outright. The only vehicles which were clearly better than the M113A1 were the XM800T, the turretless XM800W, and the XR311. 
And that was before one got to other features like armament, cost, observation capability, etc. The tests were quite thorough. They included target acquisition tests, evade to cover 50 meters away tests, which also factored in the silhouette, uh, the, the motorcycle and the dune buggy, one, that one handily. There was even an, oh bugger, the vehicle is on fire test, which the dune buggy also handily won, but probably only because the Suzuki wasn't tested. In the end, if there was going to be a winner, it probably would have been the XM800T. However, there were two problems. Firstly, the MIG-V, or the XM723, was looking like it was going to become more capable and would be well suited for conversion to cavalry duties. As indeed the Bradley series did indeed become, with obvious savings of cost from commonality. If it did work out, then all which would be needed would be an interim vehicle to cover the 15 or so years before the, the new vehicle that what would be the Bradley was fully fielded. If it did not work out, then either the interim would become permanent or a new vehicle would be chosen, probably the former. And this led to the second problem. The difference between using M113s in the interim and buying and operating XM800Ts would have been somewhere around $730,000,000 over a 15 year period. And that's 4.5 billion more or less in today's money. It just wasn't considered worth it, especially when one figured that if one added in the cargo capacity and anonymity of the M113 over the XM800T, you actually ended up with a more capable vehicle in some respects. And that basically killed that. Raptor team asked that with the follow-on question of how I would design a future US Army recon vehicle. Would it be like Ajax, which doesn't carry many dismounts, or Bradley with a small dismount team? Either way, it seems that the days of recon vehicles which rely upon stealth instead of firepower are over. It could be a reflection of just how much observation there is on the modern battlefield. You will be seen and have to fight for information and survival. Now, it may be a rather large vehicle like Ajax or just a regularly large vehicle like Jaguar, uh, but it seems that the idea of cramming all the kit that you want into something the size of a CVRT just isn't an option anymore. Note that Ajax isn't supposed to operate around on its own either. The concept is more like the CVRT family. There are five major variants and a number of sub variants, all designed to operate together and complement each other. And that's in a large-ish 40 ton vehicle. It's worth harking back to the video I did on designing vehicles of the future and how the Germans concluded that they couldn't get everything they wanted their tank to do in just one vehicle. I also noticed that when the US Marines put out the requirement specifications for the armored reconnaissance vehicle earlier this year, it mentioned a family of vehicles. So I suspect that they have come to a similar conclusion. Thus, though, I did have a preference for the large, powerful, all-in-one vehicle of the M3 for what the US Army wanted its CAV scouts to be doing at the time, it seems that there was no longer a choice in the matter. Manned vehicles, unless you're talking like ATVs or dune buggies, are going to be big and well-armed. The small sneak around type recon is, I believe, going to be the purview of robotic ground vehicles and drones. Joe Polloway, could I do a video about the Aberdeen Proving Ground reports for T-34 and KV-1 like I did with Marmon Harrington? No, I'm not sure the report exists. At least I certainly haven't found it. All I've seen are extracts from a Soviet observer's report back to home station about the tests, which are available online. But I have not seen the original tests myself. Sorry. Elis, why are IRCMs so rare on tanks and other AFVs? Do they just not work or are they too expensive? I suspect it's more that they just don't work sufficiently to justify the cost. The things will work on the specific systems it's designed to go up against, but if it's an imaging system like Javelin or a tracking system is such that an IR jammer doesn't work on it, well then it's wasted space. Though the US military has developed such equipment like the ANVLQ 6 and 8, which can be mounted on the M1 tank, even in the late 1990s it was obvious that IR jamming technology was of limited effectiveness against modern systems. You're better off fitting an active protection system, which will be effective against not only IR based systems, but anything else nasty coming at you. Maxime Lomont, 
Outside of the proposed German E-Series of World War II and the Swiss Cold War tanks, why didn't more countries use the Belleville suspension? I think it's more a question of why did the Swiss use them? Now, interestingly, it turned out that in World War II, the US Army actually tested the things. I didn't know this until I did research for this question. But in 1942, they replaced about half of the springs of an M3 medium tank with a combination of coil and Belleville washers. And uh, well, then they ran them for 310 miles. There are 25 failures of the replacement springs. The original volute springs didn't fail once. Now, in fairness, the report did observe that the VVSS bogey wasn't designed with the housing and mounting requirements of Bellevilles in mind, and they probably could have gotten it to work, but it was, quote, doubtful if the benefits of this type of spring would be worth the development work involved. So that killed off the US's position. It's not as if the suspension didn't have any merit. It did not take up any room inside the tank. It provided a more rigid firing platform at the halt and provided a smoother ride on somewhat smooth ground like tank trails. On the other hand, if you hit a big bump or anything at speed, the Bellevilles are too sluggish to respond. Now, presumably for Swiss use, they were expecting on the defense and to be using extant tank trails in large part and firing from stationary positions. When hydrogas suspension came along, such as you might find on Challenger, well, you get the major benefits of the Belleville washers with none of the downsides. A Turkish gamer asks, why did some tanks, mainly Soviet heavies, have a rear mounted MG on the turret, but stuck around until even the IS-2? Well, I had no idea. So I asked Pete Samsonov. He says it's a holdover from the Spanish Civil War where poor infantry cooperation resulted in occasional instances of the opposition climbing on the back deck of the tanks. He believes that it was retained as far as the IS is out of inertia more than out of anything else and observes that the prototypes of IS-2 didn't actually have one as there was concern of it fitting together with the cannon. Once the cannon was shown to fit, they put the MG back in. But the priority obviously was the cannon. Did the US ever have a program similar to the Air Force's constant peg? Well, that was where the US Air Force flew Soviet equipment for the US to train against. And the answer is sort of. There is a very large foreign equipment petting zoo at the Yuma test facility, which I do have to find a contact at uh, to get to, uh, where the equipment is put through its paces. On occasion, at NTC, a few Soviet vehicles would be trundled around for US crews to get a practical example of target recognition, especially through things like thermal imagers. But unlike dogfighting, where the, the specific technical capabilities of individual aircraft parameters are very important, in a tank battle, it's more the capabilities of the formation which are being tested. Thus, as long as the formation's doctrine and overall effect is correct, it doesn't matter so much if the OP4 is using actual T-72s or the far cheaper and easier to maintain surrogate vehicles like the KVT-1, the Sheridan Vismod, or the OSV. Spaceman 28. If you're going to have an unmanned turret tank, what's the advantage of a carousel autoloader versus a bustle one? Don't need to come back to this. There are two ways of doing a carousel autoloader. The flat version, such as on modern Soviet Russian tanks, or the vertical stowage ones, such as on M1 TDB. Now, there's no doubting the ammunition capacity of the TDB's design. It carried 44 rounds. The flat design, with its inherent limitations on the length of the rod, was necessary to leave room for the crew. But it's obviously not a concern with the TDB's unmanned turret. It is evident that there is going to be an upper end limit for the length of ammunition in a vertical stowage design as well, but it would be most of the height of the hull and perhaps even a little bit more depending on the design of the loading mechanism. Ammunition in a bustle autoloader can be as long as you're willing to make the bustle. Also, the loading mechanism for the bustle autoloader is easier. It's basically just a straight shot into the breech instead of having to grab around, spin it 90 degrees before being inserted. Bustle autoloaders will not, however, carry as many rounds as a hull-based carousel. At least not keep a reasonable size doing it. Then again, it is worth noting the admittedly complicated ammunition stowage system in the Cat B, which used two cassettes, one in the bustle 
and one in the hole under the bustle to achieve good automated capacity. The only catch was you needed a replenishment system to get the ammo from the hull to the bustle. Now, it did seem to work though. One of the issues with bustle stowage overall is that the turret becomes more unbalanced the more you shoot, although I suspect this isn't the problem that it used to be with modern turret traverse systems. And of course, even manned tanks use bustle stowage. The other question is that of repairability if the ammunition is detonated. I suspect that a tank may be repairable if the bustle ammunition panels blow. At least the hull should be reusable pretty simply. But if the carousel ammo explodes, even if the crew are protected behind bulkheads, I can't imagine that good things will happen to the turret mechanisms. And that runs out of the questions. I hope you found it all interesting and informative. I'll talk to you on the next one. Take care.